This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. Today I have for you sort of a follow-up to yesterday's post. Yesterday was from Pope Pius XII, his famous 1941 Pentecost address. Today I have Father Reginald Garagou Lagrange's analysis of the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to St. Thomas Aquinas. This is most appropriate, obviously, for Pentecost, for rather obvious on their face reasons. So, without further ado, I will give you this last warning before we get into this, that because we're talking about St. Thomas Aquinas, Father Reginald Garagou Lagrange's analysis here is a little dense. That having been said, without further ado, the gifts of the Holy Ghost. The seven gifts of the Holy Ghost by Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange. The Gifts of the Holy Ghost According to St. Thomas The Holy Doctor shows us three things in particular, that the gifts are habitual permanent dispositions, specifically distinct from the virtues, that the gifts are necessary to salvation, and that they are connected with charity and grow with it. St. Thomas says, quote, to differentiate the gifts from the virtues, we must be guided by the way Scripture expresses itself. For if we find there that the term employed is spirit rather than gift, for thus it is written in Isaiah, quote, The spirit of wisdom and of understanding shall rest upon him, and so on. From which words we are clearly given to understand that these seven are there set down as being in us by divine inspiration. Now, inspiration denotes motion from without, for it must be noted that in man there is a twofold principle of movement, one within him, namely the reason, the other extrinsic to him, namely God, as stated above, and also by the philosopher in the chapter on good fortune. Now, it is evident that whatever is moved must be proportionate to its mover, and the perfection of the thing moved as such consists in a disposition whereby the thing moved is made proportionate to its mover. Hence, the more exalted the mover, the more perfect must be the disposition whereby the movable object is made proportionate to its mover. Thus, we see that a disciple needs a more perfect disposition in order to receive a higher teaching from his master. Now, it is manifest that human virtues perfect man according, as it is natural for him to be moved by his reason in his interior and exterior actions. Consequently, man needs yet higher perfections, whereby to be disposed to be moved by God. These perfections are called gifts, not only because they are infused by God, but also because by them man is disposed to become amenable to divine inspiration. According to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 5, quote, The Lord hath opened my ear, and I do not resist. I have not gone back. Even the philosopher says in the chapter on good fortune that for those who are moved by divine instinct, there is no need to take counsel according to human reason, but only to follow their inner promptings, since they are moved by a principle higher than human reason. This, then, is what some say, that the gifts perfect man for acts which are higher than acts of virtue. Thus we see that the gifts of the Holy Ghost are not acts, or actual motions, or passing helps of grace, but rather qualities of permanent infused dispositions which render a man promptly docile to divine inspiration. Leo XIII in his encyclical Divinum Ulid Munus, which we quoted at length a few pages back, placed his approval on this manner of conceiving of the gifts. They dispose man to obey the Holy Ghost promptly, as a sails prepare a ship to follow the impulse of a favorable wind. By this passive docility, the gifts help us to produce those excellent works known as the Beatitudes, from this point of view, the saints are like great sailing vessels, which, under full sail, properly catch the impelling force of the wind. The art of navigation teaches a mariner how and when he may most opportunely spread his sails to profit by a favorable breeze. This figure is used by our Lord himself when he says, The Spirit breatheth where he will, and thou hearest his voice, but thou knowest not whence he cometh and whither he goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit, and is docile to his inspiration. St. Thomas says we do not really know where precisely the wind that blows was formed, or how far it will make itself felt. In the same way, we do not know where precisely a divine inspiration begins, or to what degree of perfection it would lead us if we were wholly faithful to it. Let us not be like sailing vessels, which, because of neglect in noting a favoring wind, have their sails furled when they should be spread. 
According to these principles, the great majority of theologians hold with St. Thomas that the gifts are really and specifically distinct from the infused virtues, just as the principles which direct them are distinct, that is, the Holy Ghost and reason illumined by faith. We have here two regulating motions, two different rules that constitute different formal motives. It is a fundamental principle that habits are specified by their object and their formal motive, as sight by color and light and hearing by sound. The human mind mode of acting results from the human rule. The superhuman mode results from the superhuman or divine rule, from the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, modus and mensura causator. Thus, even infused prudence proceeds by discursive deliberation, in which it differs from the gift of counsel, which disposes us to receive a special inspiration of super-discursive order. Even infused prudence hesitates, for example, about what answer to give to an indiscreet question, so as to avoid a lie and keep a secret, while special inspiration of the Holy Ghost will enable us to find a proper reply, as Christ told his disciples. Likewise, while faith adheres simply to reveal truth, the gift of understanding makes us scrutinize their depths, and that of wisdom makes us taste them. The gifts are thus specifically distinct from the virtues. St. Thomas adds in his Summa a statement that he had not made in his commentary on the sentences, namely, that the gifts of the Holy Ghost are necessary to salvation. The Book of Wisdom tells us, in fact, that, quote, God loveth none but him that dwelleth with wisdom. And when we read it in Ecclesiasticus, he that is without fear of God cannot be justified. Wisdom is the highest of gifts, and fear the lowest. Moreover, St. Thomas notes that even the infused virtues, both theological and moral, which are adapted to the human mode of our faculties, leads, leave us in a state of inferiority in regard to our supernatural end, which should be known a more, in a more lively, more penetrating, more delightful manner, and toward which we ought to advance with greater ardor. Even when faith is elevated, it remains essentially imperfect for three reasons. One, because of the obscurity of its object, which it does not attain immediately, but through a glass in a dark manner. Two, it attains its object only by multiple dogmatic formulas, whereas God is supremely simple. Three, it attains its object in an abstract manner, by affirmative and negative propositions, whereas on the contrary, the living God is the light of life, whom we ought to be able to know not in an abstract manner, but in a quasi-experimental manner. Hope shows the imperfection of faith, and so does charity, as long as it, uh, its object is proposed by faith. With even greater reason, prudence, though infused, is imperfect from the fact that it must have recourse to reasoning, to the search for reasons for acting in order to direct the moral virtues. It frequently hesitates, for example, about a suitable answer to give to an indiscreet question, so as to keep a secret and avoid a lie. In certain cases, only a good inspiration would be necessary to do so. The same thing is true when it's a case of efficaciously resisting certain temptations, either subtle or violent or prolonged. Human reason, says St. Thomas, even when perfected by the theological virtues, does not know all things or all possible things. Consequently, it is unable to avoid fully stultutia and other like things. God, however, to, to whose knowledge and power all things are subject, by his motion safeguards us from all folly, ignorance, dullness of mind, hardness of heart, and the rest. Consequently, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, which make us docile to his promptings, are said to be given as remedies for these defects. In this sense, they are necessary to salvation, as sails are on a vessel, that it may be responsive to a favorable wind, although it may advance also by means of oars. These two ways of advancing are quite distinct, although they may be united or simultaneous. By the theological and moral virtues, says St. Thomas, man is not so perfected in response of his last end as not to end in continual need of being moved by the yet higher promptings of the Holy Ghost. This need is permanent in man. For this reason, the gifts are in us in a permanent infused disposition. We make use of the gifts somewhat as we do of the virtue of obedience. In order to receive a superior direction with docility and to act according to this direction, but we do not have this superior inspiration whenever we wish. This sense by means of the gifts we are passive in regards to the Holy Ghost that we may act under his influence. This will explain more clearly why, like obedience, the gifts are permanent disposition in the just man. The great fitness and even this necess necessity of gifts is better seen if we consider the perfection which each of them gives either to the intellect or to the will and to the sensible part of the soul, as St. Thomas points out. The following synopsis explains the statement just made. The perfect gifts include the understanding enlightened by faith. In one part, this leads 
to the search for the penetration of truth and the gift of understanding or the gift of faith. This also leads to the gift to be able to judge of divine things. This is the gift of wisdom of created things. This, this is the gift of knowledge and of our ability to judge our own actions is the gift of counsel. This also leads to the perfected will and the sensitive appetites first in relation and relative to our worship due to God, which is the gift of piety against the fear of danger, which is the gift of fortitude and against disorderly concupiscences, which is the gift of fear. And together we understand these having the corresponding virtues of faith, charity, hope, prudence, religion, and temperance. We see that those gifts which direct the others are superior. Among them, the gift of wisdom is the highest because it gives us a quasi-experimental knowledge of God and thereby a judgment about divine things, which is superior even to the penetration of the gift of understanding, which belongs rather to first apprehension than to judgment. The gift of knowledge corresponds to hope in this sense, that it makes us see the emptiness of created things and of human help, and consequently the necessity of placing our confidence in God in order to attain to the possession of him. The gift of fear also perfects hope by preserving us from presumption, but it corresponds also to temperance to aid us against temptations. To these seven gifts correspond the Beatitudes, which are their acts, as St. Thomas so well shows. Finally, from the necessity of the gifts for salvation, it follows that they are connected with charity, according to St. Paul's words to the Romans. The charity of God is poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, who is given to us. The Holy Ghost does not come to us without his seven gifts, which thus accompany charity, and which consequently are lost with it by mortal sin. They thus belong to the spiritual organism of sanctifying grace, which is the, therefore called the grace of the virtues and gifts. Since all the infused virtues grow together like the five fingers of the hand, the same must be said of the seven gifts. Hence, we cannot conceive of a Christian having that high degree of charity which is proper to perfection, without at the same time having the gifts of the Holy Ghost in a proportionate degree, although perhaps in him the gifts of understanding and of wisdom may be exercised under a less contemplative and more practical form than in others. This was the case with St. Vincent de Paul and many other saints who were called to devote themselves to their neighbor in the works of the active life. We shall treat later of docility to the Holy Ghost and of the conditions it demands, but we see even now the value of the spiritual organism, which is eternal life begun in us. This life is more precious than sight, than physical life, than the use of reason in this sense, that the loss of the use of reason does not deprive the just man of his treasure, which death itself cannot snatch from us. This grace of the virtues and gifts is also more precious than the gifts of miracles or the tongues of prophecy. For these charismata are, so to speak, only exterior supernatural signs, which can point out the way that leads to God, but cannot unite us to him as sanctifying grace and charity can. To see more clearly how the diverse functions used of this spiritual organism should be exercised, we must speak of the actual grace necessary to the exercise of the virtues and gifts. But that last portion is for another time. Like I said at the beginning, this was a little dense, but thus is the nature of moral theology, <laughs> and of theology more broadly. Let me know if you want to hear in the, in the near future his uh, writings on the exercise of the virtues of gifts and of grace. And let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Is the um, are the words here of uh, Father Reginald Garagou Lagrange difficult for for people? And I don't mean difficult because they're complex, but difficult because they challenge you and what you think of and what you have been told are the gifts of the Holy Ghost and how they actually work. Saint Thomas, of course, always makes things a little more dense, and that's what Father Garagou Lagrange was doing here was going over St. Thomas, but let me know what you thought of this, if this was helped clear things up and more muddied the water some. Anyway, today's Pentecost Sunday. Please go to Mass, and I hope you have a blessed Sunday.